Here we are, gentlemen. Inside that building are hundreds of cans of 16mm film. Tasty. Very tasty. How long will you need? About half an hour. I'll send these two back with the car. There's no need. I'll take the bus. Those telecine machines are pretty bulky. Better to use the car. Right. Anyway, we're not going back to the Something Who bunker. We're doing the job today. That's sort of sudden, isn't it? You had something else planned? I uh, haven't watched Twice Upon a Time yet for the podcast. I was expecting a bit more notice. We go today without fail. What if I can't get the telecines? You assured me there'd be no slip-ups. Yeah, but seven machines at such short notice. I hope you're not telling me there'll be problems, Ant. Because if you are, I shall be mildly irritated. Don't worry, I'll get the stuff. Good. Jobs today. Well, I don't know. He's playing to everything so close. Seven machines? Must be something with seven episodes. Look, don't argue. Just have the stuff ready. I'm on my way in. I don't think he likes this very much, Richard. Well, if he lets us down, he'll have reason not to. You, Gav, will tell the world why Marco Polo isn't iTunes ready. Which is probably the nichest gag I've ever come up with on this podcast. (laughs) Very, very tasty. It's very tasty. Uh, There we go. I'm not sure. We had the Beast of Joss, didn't we? Back in the whole of Fangot sketch. Oh, yeah. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) Welcome to the podcast where we take something old, a Doctor Who story from the original series, compare it with something new, one from the new series, and add something borrowed, that sketch, to make something who... Hello, I'm Richard, and we're back with Something Who Podcast, episode 65, where we discuss a couple of Doctor Who stories that revisit the locations of previous adventures. First, we'll look at Sixth Doctor story, Attack of the Cybermen, from season 22. And after that, we'll examine Twelfth Doctor caper, Twice Upon a Time, which was his final outing in Christmas 2017. And if you're disappointed that our sketch references Attack, then check out the preview episode of 13 cast from 2018, which is on this very feed, for a sketch that's based on Twice Upon a Time. So with me to decide whether these stories are worthy sequels or pale imitations, we have a great lineup, starting with the return to our ranks of the multi-talented 3D artist, writer, researcher, podcaster, and co-creator of Dalek 63 to 88, Gav Rymel. Hello. Hey. Yeah. Hi, Gav. In an ideal world... I'd have been playing with your first Doctor TARDIS diorama all weekend, but sadly adult stuff took over. <laughs> Boring. But a great design. You've got a food machine to make. You need to get your priorities straight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I've even got my uh, original green console to go with it. Nice. Ooh. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe next weekend. It was so well on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Next up, science and astronomy writer Giles. Evening. Good to be back. Giles, hi. Are you looking forward to the time meddler at the BFI? Are you going? I am indeed, yes. Yeah, yes. should be yeah. fun. I mean, I was I was all set to buy a ticket, and then just as I was about to order it, something sounded familiar about the date, and then I remembered it's my daughter's birthday, so uh, ah. sadly not. She loves the time meddler. Bring her along. <laughs> <laughs> she, she said it's her favourite. I mean, she probably has watched it, because we went through all the black and whites together, but... Uh, yeah, I, I, I think I would be, that would be a that would be a tough sell. I think. Mm. Bit of a souvenir space helmet for a cow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And finally, a newcomer to something who, but very well known, I'm sure, to our listeners, graphic designer and illustrator Anthony Lamb. Hello, good to see you. 
Yeah, yes, and, and you too. And, and, and while this may be your first appearance on something who, uh, you know, we've all heard you on other podcasts and Gav frequently shares things that, he's, that you've told him uh, on the podcast here. So uh, Not too much, I hope. Secret <laughs> stories. Mm. Yeah, he's, he's thrown you over the, under the bus once or twice, I think. That's okay. Rude facts. Hopefully it was an inflatable bus. <laughs> okay, so banter over. <laughs> uh... well, hopefully not permanently. Yeah. I might come out with some choice nuggets. <laughs> we 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 move on to Attack of the Cybermen from Banter uh, Over, definitely. Yeah, by Paula Moore, the famous writer. Who and me? she's in my top ten favorite classic female Doctor Who writers. <laughs> Very good, uh, and directed by Matthew Robinson. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I, I suppose to set the scene. It's January 1985. I'm about to start the second term at sixth form. I'm a fully paid up DWAS member. I'm looking forward to a story that's revisiting what we all know is the greatest Doctor Who story ever made, Tomb of the Cybermen, even though no one in the UK has seen it since 1967, which means (laughs) I haven't seen it at all. And also, because it's the era of VHS, at least in our household, it's a story I've watched many times but probably not in the last 30 years. <laughs> so I guess that's how I came across Attack of the Cybermen. What about the rest of you? I got this in that brief period of time when I had access to a special man. And if I whispered magic words or sent him a, a, a check in the post, I would get bootleg Doctor Who VHSs. Right. So that's how I first saw Attack of the Cybermen relatively recently in the grand scheme of things, about 96, 97. So you're jumping over the VHS release. It came in a tin with, I think, the 10th planet. Oh, yeah. I remember the planet in a tin. Tasting down. Or something. That's that's how I first saw it. I was was four years old or something when it was transmitted, Mm. not yet able to use the television or indeed know what was going on. So I didn't see it until the VHS box set. Yeah, and I thought it was somewhat acceptable. It was 2000 for the VHS and 2009 for the DVD. Yeah, this would have been one I... I probably also, I think I joined the DWAS in between 84 and 85. So I my Celestial Toy Rooms through the post. Hmm. Uh, I can't remember whether... I give, did we know that this was going to be? Was this hyped as being a, a sequel to Tomb? Yeah, well, I think time? so. I can't really. I guess it probably would have been. And, it, um, certainly, that's in my head anyway. That that it was. Mm. It, may, it might have been uh, even mentioned in Doctor Who Monthly or something like that. Mm. Yeah, this was pre VHS for me, so it was probably something I listened to for ages on my home tape C ninety cassettes mm. before it got chewed up inevitably by by the. Um, by the tape recorded gods. Dog. Always a sad day when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> just yes. why we weren't relying on those audio recordings, Giles. Yeah, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> <if anything. laughs> yes, you know, that would have been the Graham Strong of my day. Yeah. Mm. With a hexagonal pencil. You know, we just had to have a... You had to have, <laughs> had to have one with a hex, hex, hexagonal barrel in order to uh, <laughs> engage with the cogs on the old cassette. Yeah. Yeah. Also, Great. your little your little finger is also oh, quite yes. useful. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's That's I've got a really qu- bizarrely strong memory of just ratcheting the little yeah. cog in there. Yeah, it's yeah. Muscle memory is is doing it now. <laughs> it's like, I can feel it. Mm. Mm. Okay, let's let. Well, I'll pull us out of that particular cul-de-sac. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, in watching it now, the first thing that came to me actually is quite similar to what to how I felt when I watched it the first time, which is it does feel structurally a little bit odd in that part one of, of Attack of the Cybermen feels to me like a stretch 25-minute episode. I mean, it feels like you get about the same sort of things that you get in a, in a part one of a four-parter. And then it feels to me like part two is about parts two and three stuck together, and I feel like it's missing a part four somewhere along the line, or, or, yeah. or if, if there is any, it's very compressed at the end. Mm. I do feel it ends very abruptly, and on a, I know it's a bit, maybe a bit soon to start talking about the very ending, but I think it ends on the note where the Doctor's saying, oh, I don't think I've judged, misjudged someone as badly as some, I've misjudged Lytton. And to be honest, 
I don't know why. Like he, he <laughs> exactly, yeah. He was a he was a Dalek mercenary, <laughs> and, and then he was a, a criminal element. Like he had no reason to have any faith in him at all. Mm. And so the fact mm. that it ends on this sort of point where it feels like it's leaving you with a little brain morsel to consider until <laughs> next week, and I, I don't really think it's earned that little thing. And, it, and for, so mm. as a result. It's it just sort of ends and then move, and then you just sort of don't think about it again because there's very little brain food. Mm. Mm. I was chatting with my friend Ian and mentioned that we were going to be doing these two and and he he brought up exactly the same point. He said, "Yeah, no, you didn't misjudge him. What's you know just because he happened to be working for the um, arbitrary good guys on this occasion? Mm. It's, um, he was a hired but gun. He was, yeah. It turned out he was hired by the Cryons and not the Cybermen. Mm. So what?" Mm. Yes. I do I do find his plan generally a little confusing. <laughs> like uh, he, yeah. he was he he was masquerading as a criminal, but he must have been doing real criminal activity because the police were onto him. Hmm. Yeah. And so then he demanded that they take an Uzi, which he then never used, and then knew that they were going to encounter the Cybermen and just give his gun over. Uh, yeah. and he told what's his name, his hired gun, told him to stay back and watch the tunnels with a gun. But at the same time, he's also activated this homing beacon. Hmm. I mean, maybe it does make sense, and I've not really picked up on it. But as it is, I'm slightly confused. No, it doesn't. Because, I mean, here's a big question. What is this story about? How would you briefly summarize the plot? What is, what is the thrust of this story? Uh, fan service? <laughs> <laughs> Dislikable characters being aggressive at each other. Okay, well, I'll start you off with a question. Why did the Cybermen have a base in the sewers? No, it's a good question. Mm. I can't think. I can't think of a reason. Because they but, used to have a base in the sewers yeah. in in uh, the invasion. <laughs> mm. Like, given that their plot is in theory about destroying the Earth with, I think, probably yeah. a bomb or something. They well. Halley's Comet, right? Halley's Comet. Yeah. Oh yeah, Halley's it's Comet. Halley's, yeah. It's Halley's mm. Comet. But we don't know that from the Cybermen. We only have other we only get that information second hand. Yeah. Mm. The weirdest thing about this story is that the primary threat which is introduced at the start but that we don't know about is Halley's Comet and Perry's very worried about mm. it and the doctor isn't. And then we later discover that that is the ticking time bomb in the story. It's never mentioned from the point of view of the villains, we learn that the villains' main objective, the Cybermen, is to destroy Telos. That's what they're doing throughout the story. We hear about their updated plan all the time. You've got Stratton and Bates planting the bombs. Mm. Uh, you've got the cyber people discussing its detonation. You've got the Cryons complaining about mm. it. And that's what's ultimately stopped by a different explosion, seemingly. Uh, and that resolves that storyline. The Halley's Comet thing, despite being Chekhov's comet in the first mm, act, yeah. never comes up again. Perry just says at the end, well, the Earth's safe, isn't it? <laughs> and it's the weirdest thing. And, and uh, you were saying about there being no episode four, and that's a really good summary of the feeling you're left with because you don't get the tension of the threat. There's no, there's no denouement where there's a, there's a countdown mm. or tension or jeopardy. There's, there's no situation where the peril is trying to be stopped except for the secondary one which is the Cybermen arbitrarily destroying Telos and it's really really weird and that's part of the reason it's sort of disjointed and an empty feeling because you're because because you only ever see the characters trying to get out of situations they've just got into like the doctor escaping from the cell which by coincidence mm. happens to have all the explosives in that resolve the story <laughs> But people are just sort of b bumbling their way through. It's yeah, it's odd that um, Paul and Moore apparently came across a plot device so similar, though, to um, to the one that Eric Saywood had used a few years earlier in Earthshock, mm. Earthshock of smashing yeah, a weird smashing that. a um, yeah projectile into the Earth to cause Well, they were a, friends, um, so presumably she'd watched well, his episode. I mean, I, I mean, yeah. I guess what we've got here is a situation that's very similar to to say. Celestial toy maker or something like that. I mean, Paula Moore has written something, and then what we actually get is Eric Saywood's massively rewritten version of it. You know, or you know, we've got Ambassadors of Death written by David Whittaker. No, it isn't. Uh, it's really written by Malcolm Hulk and Terence Dick. So, so 
I, I'm, I'm not saying that she wrote a lot. Well, she wrote she wrote something. That's that's not the case, though, is it? The theory was that she wrote a, a story lot, a story outline, or something. Did she? Did she? My understanding is that Saywood wanted to write it, couldn't commission himself, so it was commissioned under her name for legal reasons, and he delivered the whole thing. Um, I think I have read that actually with notes based on far too much input from uh, from Ian Levine. Ian Levine, yeah, is, Ian Levine, Ian of Levine this apparently <laughs> gave him some notes on Tomb of the Cybermen. Mm, which raises interesting questions about the quality of Ian's other notebooks. So so I think I got the Paul and Moore thing off the DVD subtitles, which kind of suggested that, or the Blu-ray subtitles, which kind of suggested there was, there really was a Paul and Moore. But I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, to, to be dogmatic about that because I read it on the screen. Well, I'm just going off what Eric Saywood says. So yes. Whether he's covering his tracks is is uh, another matter, or somebody else's <laughs> tracks. But then why why would you uh, why would you take credit for Attack of the Cybermen? Then again, that's, as, that's the real question. As Toby was saying the other the other week, um, if Donald Tosh, maybe maybe I would say it's a bit like Donald Tosh. <laughs> uh, if nobody else is around to take credit for something, um, I, I read apparently Paula Moore's real name is Paula Woolsey. Yeah, um, I don't know why it's changed. Is that like a, a, a credit name, a stage name for a writer, a pseudonym? Mm. Paula Agnew. Ag- yes. <laughs> <laughs> Going back down the plot structure thing, that's a in- very interesting point that I, I managed to overlook as my, frankly, my brain dribbled out of my ears <laughs> during the course <laughs> of, <laughs> of rewatching this. But I did did notice that with, I slightly disagree. It's kind of a it's a thing I always kind of think in retrospect about season 22 that, oh, they're always stretching the first episode so that the first episode of, the four, of a 45-minute one becomes a first episode of a... Oh, yeah, you know what I mean. They expand the first episode and then cram the other three into the second half. Yeah, so- in this case, I felt like... I, I noticed that the reveal of the side men is at exactly the halfway mark. It is mm. at the exact 25-minute mm. where it would have been the cliffhanger. To an episode mm. one, so I thought well, maybe that's yeah. The... That first quarter mm. of episode, well, the first half of episode mm. one, is is quite engaging and pretty solid, yes, yeah. really. The only reason, just to go back to my rhetorical question, what's it about? Why the Cybermen in the sewers? The only reason the Cybermen were in the sewers was because Lytton tricked them into coming to Earth to take him to Telos, because the Cryons had contacted him to ask for help in repelling the Cybermen from their invasion of Telos. So when you see the Cyber base, it makes no narrative sense whatsoever because the Cybermen are only mm. there to respond to Lytton. But then Lytton only faked his bank heist to get some goons to come with him to meet the Cybermen in the hope of being taken to Telos. Mm. And, and the Cybermen have got a ship on the far side of the moon because that's what happened in the invasion, for reasons. Yeah. I mean, presumably that's they've got... They got to get there somehow, but yeah, it's it's all references, isn't they it? They end up going by Tardis in the it, end. <laughs> it, it, it's a shame because the, the 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 bank heist component of the first half of the first episode mm. is enjoyable and feels like it's quite sort of um, earthy and interesting way to if go. They've gone somewhere, yeah, yeah. But because the heist turns out to be the means to get lit into meet the Cybermen, and then coincidentally that allows the Doctor to find the Cybermen because he's only on the tale of mm. Lytton. Um, so all of these things that you think are going to be narrative threads, they just sort of fall away and you, you get to the end of episode one and there's been no actual plot. It's 45 minutes of, of people just bumping into each other. And walking. <laughs> and it's, walking it's a lot, a lot, it's of walking a lot like the beginning of Revelation uh, where the Doctor and Perry just spend the entire first episode. Like you were saying, Giles, it feels like it's just stretched and so they don't actually do anything. Not that we're talking about Revelation right now. But the beginning of this leaves me with a similar uh, mm. taste. Although I do, I agree, Gavin, like the, the idea of a, a a bank heist with some sort of real earthbound criminals would have been great. And if, if some Cybermen were to intersect with that story, it might be nice. Mm. Not that I'm sure. Yeah. The Cybermen have their own plan that happens to be in the sewers. Lytton's doing a bank heist in the sewers. And those two destinies intersect mm. that that's quite an interesting idea yes it feels like have a, have a MacGuffin, have something that he's trying to steal that actually relates to the that yeah. relates to the plot 
because you yeah mm. like telly mm. yeah but um the the weird thing is that you then get this injection of 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 telos sudden the sudden telos scenes and that should be exciting and it's quite you know it tickles your brain but we're given no understanding as to its significance and even with the foreknowledge of of tomb of the cybermen you you just kind of bewildered watching an, another new strand unfold and you're just sort of left feeling empty because there's no narrative substance to anything it's it's all just all the dialogue small talk and the first 45 minutes is is people saying uh i should have known and we've been expecting you and mm. I, th- I think that feeling of emptiness is not helped by the fact that the work party escape and subsequent antics with those two characters whose name i've forgotten their plan actually doesn't affect anything or come to anything no. No. so that again that again on their personal story that also doesn't really have an ending no uh, i mean they get killed they get obviously killed. But that's... <laughs> <laughs> and added to that the objective that they're striving for is in irrelevance within the story as well because that time machine we're never told of of the significance of that time machine within the plot even before the Doctor turns up and the Cybermen rub their hands that they've now got their hands on a time machine, if we don't know when any of the stories set no. ex- except the present day stuff. So if we assume the Telos stuff is also in 1985, then the time machine has nothing to do with the, the, the Halley's Comet plan. It's a total irrelevance, and Stratton and Bates' mission to seize it is just completely meaningless. Well, apparently it was their ship to start with. Stratton and Bates. Apparently, I, I, I read I read a plot synopsis, and I didn't get this from the uh, from watching the thing. Uh, I can't remember what plot synopsis it was, but it claimed that it was actually their ship, and they were trying to get it back. And I I don't know how I can rationalise that. I can't remember any dialogue that's in there. No, because I was gonna I was gonna complain about the fact that they in no way seem competent to be anywhere near a time sp- a time ship mm. no. so uh, yeah maybe that's an erroneous note so is this set after the tomb of the cybermen because well, if it is then it must be in the 2500 wasn't it i think it is because the cyber the cyber controller is apparently the same one and he's exploded here whereas before he only melted i think at the end of tomb but then, but equally, I mean, if it is set in the far future, what's the hurry? Because you can go back to nineteen eighty five slash six whenever you want. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that means that the Cybermen. So hang on. So that means the Cryons. So the the Cryon yeah. the, the, cryon, the, cryon, the, yeah the, the Cryons and Lytton were communicating through time with each other. The cryons from the far future responded to Lytton's distress signal and said, fine, we'll... No, I, no, I, I've I, lost I it. Can't. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> I'm, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that I, that I you know, recommended the plot, but be that, I think that's what, how I, I understood it. Yeah, no, that's, that's even worse because that then relies, as you say, on the Cybermen getting hold of the TARDIS in order to return to Telos, unless the ship on the far side of the moon was a time machine as well. I mean, it could be that they were hoping to do all of their comings and goings through time with the ship that Stratton and Bates were trying to recapture or capture. And then the TARDIS was basically a spare, not that mm. that necessarily means mm. much. I just, pl- it's, that's plausible, but I'm just trying to think, don't they have, don't they have some reference to the fact that the time machine... Has just arrived. Doesn't work, or they they can't use it. I thought they I thought they said that the Cybermen couldn't operate it, or they didn't understand it, or something. Yeah, I'm trying mm. to... yeah. Is that the time machine that comes and lands on the the launch pad in the model shot towards the end? Because I was going to oh. say that I don't think we even saw it, but then I don't know what that little spaceship is that comes and lands. Mm. Mm. Not sure about that. It's funny to talking about it as a as a sequel to tomb because obviously that's present in the setting but again it's an irrelevance and the the critical piece of continuity is is with the 10th planet rather than tomb because yeah. that it, it's foreknowledge of the 10th planet that uh that guides your understanding of why mondas is significant and why mm. 
it matters if if the Earth is destroyed by Halley's Comet. Yeah. And as a bit of fan service goes, the return to Telos <clears throat> and the Ice Tombs isn't even satisfying in that way because it just doesn't seem remotely like the same place. No. Like there are no, no common design elements. There's no. nothing. Yeah, it's... Well, it's uh... It works against it works against Attack of the Cybermen. Those references to Tomb for that reason, not just the lack of continuity, but the the production design is so flat in Attack. I mean, it's not even it's not even good in its own mm. right. You know, if they'd created another new memorable Tomb design, mm. then you might forgive it. But it's just so boring. It's just stock flats and recycled. Props. Yeah, I know, I'm not, so not expecting to copy slavishly a design from the 60s necessarily, but a few elements would be nice. And the thing is, they you know they they were used to expanding sets with the occasional bit of map painting and stuff like that, and they've been doing that for over the past few years. We've seen bits of it in like the visitation and so yeah. on, and you know it's just like why do you not? Okay, I know they couldn't build a multi-level set for the tombs but why not just take a why not just do a match shot where you give some impression of height or structure or what the general mm. geography of these things is mm. and I personally I thought that the um interesting what you were saying because I thought that the Cybermen sewer base was actually quite effective by comparison with mm. you know and that that actually looked quite cool compared to compared to the stuff you actually saw on Telos which appears to suffer from the kind of Gallifrey executive suite design. Um, mm. Mm. <laughs> not quite as bad, but I think it's even worse than you than you than your discussion because not only does it not look like Tomb of the Cybermen, it doesn't work the same way either. I mean, in Tomb of the Cybermen, you've got all the Cybermen in a tomb, which when you press a button, they all instantly defrost and yeah. come back mm. to life. In this case, you know, they seem to be being brought back to life individually there's this thought that oh well you know the reason why they came to tell us is because they built refrigerated cities because the cryons needed them because they are creatures of the cold there's no indication in tomb that tell is a particularly cold place i mean you know obviously the tomb bit is uh, is refrigerated but you know how are the how the cryons come to exist on a planet that looks perfectly bog standard, and then it can't be super cold on Telos in Tomb because then they're able to defrost the Cybermen quite rapidly. Mm. I mean, unless they've got mm. a massive great heater, but then the problem with that is that the the Cybermen are short of power, so you know, it can't be that surely. <laughs> Do we also mm. see some liquid water on the ground on the location footage in Tomb? I'm not entirely certain. I've just got a vague. Maybe this is stuff that I missed between the between everyone talking through masks and voice processing and stuff like that. I and mean, I was just losing so much of the plot, to be honest, if they were, if it was there. But so the, the Cybermen that are waking up and going mad. Yeah. Is that is that something the Cryons are doing? Is that or is that that they? I don't think it's explained. Sorry? Is that not explained? It's is not it, made clear. If it is, is it explained. again just for a cool image because they because Ian Levine. Like that bit in Invasion where, where they have the Cybermen driven mad by its yeah, by the emotion overload, yeah. um, and and why the yeah, why except in a fit of peak, why do, why exactly do they want to blow up Telos when they leave it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a bit putting the car putting the car before the horse. We're so certain that we're going to save Mondas with our with our plot bridges. that we with our plot that we're never going to actually refer to ourselves. Um, <laughs> That's not only are we waking everyone up and we're going to leave, but we're also going to blow up our line of retreat behind us. It's yeah, it's so weird to have created nobody, that. Nobody ever expects the Cybermen's strategy to to uh, play out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm also amused that they were planning to blow up the planet just by um, some bombs that were planted by a bunch of guys just over there somewhere. Mm. Um, yeah, just putting <laughs> some small devices in the sand. Yeah. Just to go back to um, what Anthony was saying about the... Um, yeah, that is actually a line. The, the thing about Stratton and Bates, about... Um, I've got the transcript up in front of me, and it, has, it says um, two of the work party have escaped. I think it's the cyber controller's first scene when mm. they say Stratton and Bates have escaped, and he says that's to be expected. They will attempt to recapture their ship. 
Oh yeah, that's it. Charlene wow. struck the time. No, Charlene struck the time vessel on its return to remain in orbit. Says Cyberman One. Can I point out that's one of the bad, most badly delivered lines <laughs> in the entire story? Sorry, my, takes... me, me or the me or Cyberman? Oh no, one. no, you you <laughs> you, were, you were delightful. I mean, the Cyberman saying that shall I instruct them to remain in orbit? It's just cringeworthy uh, lethargy uh, and. So, you do you know? I, I think the poor, <laughs> <laughs> I think the poor delivery of that Cyberman has distracted me from recognizing that he's delivering relevant bits of mm. plot. But, I'm so paying attention to that weird voice and modulation that I'd never realized the time machine. Yeah, it feels turning. like they're, he's doing a takeoff of the Cyberman voice from the tenth planet. You know, it's like it's more like, mm. da, 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 uh, but, but 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 with lots more modulation because it's the eighties. But I mean, I don't know why you would be doing a takeoff of the Cybermen from Ian Levine told yeah. them to. Mm. While we're, while oh. we're talking about um, lovable Cybermen, I'm going to pause for thought about the Cybermen extras because a great many of them are actual comedy gold. Um, <laughs> like the most obvious, the most obvious example being when they discover the powder that's about to blow up after they put it in the mm. cell <laughs> and he just says no run away run away and he's yeah, flapping his arms so flappy, isn't he? <laughs> and, and also i think my, my other favorite one is on in the background of that scene we just referenced with the with that important exposition mm-hmm. there's just one <laughs> pottering about on the platform at the background just doing tiny tiny little footsteps and he's like he, st- he steals that scene <laughs> can't lie. Mm. Oh dear! Now, now, you're, now you're note. actually giving me a reason to go back and watch <laughs> this again. Oh, so, embrace it! Just there's one, there's one yeah. Cyberman who does Not- a bit of business where he's checking the wires <laughs> on one of the converted people, but fails to actually touch or do anything. Yeah. He just sort of wafts his hand oh, over he's, it. He's, he's like a uh, delightful. He's way. like Crichton in his first episode when he wants everything just so. He's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, so coming back to that business about the cryons. The doctor has this line, it seems your people have done quite a lot already. I assume you're responsible for the stench of death everywhere. Oh. Which doesn't necessarily mean that, that they're making them go rogue, but they're obviously doing it's something. IBS. Mm. So the stench of death, I mean, that's that's the the other thing with this. Aside from the, aside from the plot, it's just tonally for me, it's just like, you know, what were they, I mean, I guess we, you know, we're in the Mid eighties, I guess it's the era of video nasties and hmm. things. Like, but just what were they thinking? Does seem unnecessarily the, harsh. The amount of gore and you know, just let's have green, green guns squirting everywhere. And, you know, it's not blood. But then you do get blood because or of... decapitating, and then you get yeah, and then you get blood and you know decapitating. So it's just like it completely went to their head because everyone was impressed by the five doctors. Yeah, mm, and there's two there's but, two beheadings in the same episode, mm, which seems a bit unnecessary yeah. as well. I guess it that you know Eric Sabert's world view was this somewhat juvenile. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I, I found the note that I made about um, these the scripts from the DVD. Yeah, 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 what the Blu-ray um, mm. subtitles. It just said Sayward had to rewrite the scripts with Robinson. Uh, Matthew Robinson, so right. it doesn't necess- doesn't prove anything either way, but um, okay. that, 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 I mean maybe that's just a a nice way of saying it rather than saying he, he had to write it from scratch. I don't know. Mm. I would suspect. I mean, the DVD subtitles. I don't know who's writing those particular ones, but they tended to they're quite explicit repurpose about it, aren't they? older stuff from like Doctor Who magazine mm. and the Frame right. and other magazines that documented this, and those would be based upon earlier and sort of towing the party line in yeah. terms of official versions of things. Sure. So I would suspect that that the DVD subtitles reflect the cover story that they put out and that Eric Saywood, when he finally did the DVD interview, thought that it was probably too late for him to get into trouble, so he was just honest about it. And just said he he lied and he did it to get around union mm. rules. Mm. My memory also is doing Michael Kilgariff a bit of a disservice. I I I, had, I remembered him as being sort of like Mister Blobby, <laughs> but in fact mm. he, he's not he's not quite as big as yeah the mind remembers no, him. No. 
but still too big. <laughs> still the wrong shape. But can yeah. he... Still a beautiful pear. That's a pear shape. I don't mean he's got a beautiful pear. <laughs> Getting back to that tonal tonal thing, I think I mean that's the thing with Stratton and Bates that and a, a lot of this I think it's say we're trying to you know, assuming it is him. I think he's trying to emulate again. It's it's just like oh, looking back at the greatest hits of you know and again oh Androzani went down well. Let's do lots of hard bitten people. I mean, it's that sort of snarky. Mm. So the, the, the stuff that the gun runners are doing, but without any of the, yeah, you know, wit, wit. exactly. And I quite like, I, I, you know, I, I've, I remember really liking Michael Atwell as, as a uh, Bill Sykes in the, um, in Terence and Barry's Oliver Twist, Sunday Sunday Night, classic, mm-hmm. in a, about the same period, and um, but here he's just like, everyone just stop shouting, and you know. And they managed to, yeah. And Brian Glover even doesn't really. Um, it's, he's probably still the best thing in it, but he, yeah. But you know, <laughs> not compared to. There are a few nice performances in this actually. Brian Glover being one of them. Mm. Also, I think uh, Maurice Coburn is. Uh, that's that's mm. his name. I got that right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He's very watchable, uh, and it's nice to see a, a recurring character of of his ilk. Not necessarily a bad guy. He's sort of, I suppose. In, in a similar category to Glitz, maybe. Not quite sure. But no, I, I just mm. really enjoy enjoy seeing his development for what it was. Obviously, it was rushed, as we've discussed. It's almost a shame he dies after that quick revelation. Yeah, so he had to mm. go off and uh, be in Howard's way, didn't he? I yeah. Guess. Uh, pretty probably <laughs> after that. But, um... I did laugh at the revelation that... Lytton is from a planet of mercenaries. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh dear. And and he, and, and the whole, yeah. They, they just they works. just hunt e- hunt each other in a yeah. cycling Ouroboros. How, how does that society function? <laughs> <laughs> it's just all imports. Mm. <laughs> and the whole thing. We've with got him, no farming. We've got no entertainment system. We're all just mercenaries. <laughs> Waiting for the next shipment of food to land. Yeah. <laughs> no, no one's co- no one's collected the rubbish for seventeen uh, years. Oh golly, it's, it, 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 it's going to be here in about a decade. Yeah. Oh. Uh, that, yeah. that whole thing where he trots out the um trots out the designation of where his what his home planet is. It's just a string of Greek letters and numbers. And what is yeah. the name of the moon? Vift on five. Yeah. Like, oh. He says, what's the name of your satellite? Yeah. What a weird question. Yeah. I think I think Eric Sayward had, had, had got excited by a slightly technical word for no reason. <laughs> I don't know. Because he doesn't say he's from the satellite, does he? No. Well, I suppose he could be referring to the uh, planet as a satellite of the sun or their star. I don't think so in that context. Why, why is the moon called Vift on five when um, it doesn't make any <laughs> <laughs> Any <Nah>. sense compared? <laughs> the planet's not called <laughs> Rifton, <laughs> and there's only one moon. <laughs> <laughs> it's never going to get past the International Astronomical Union, is it? Hmm. No. Maybe there used to be more moons, but all the mercenary activity destroyed them. <laughs> <laughs> they were paid by various people to destroy all of the other moons. Uh, it's a shame because it, it's you know it flitted through my head a, a, about this, and then I thought, no, it, obviously he wasn't. But but you know, you've got when you've got the um, Orsini and, and the yeah. order mm. of you know, and that's a Gaunt. that's a much more yeah. William Gaunt and you know comes up at Revelation, and again it's a, but as a Is he from the same planet. Well, yeah, it's a shame he, shame he wasn't, or like a member yeah. of the order of what are they, Knights o- of Oberon, or Oberon. yeah, Oberon, Oberon. Mm. which is a satellite yeah. of. Was... Uranus. <laughs> I guess so. It was a satellite of Uranus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Don't know where I'm going with that. Thought it would be would have been nice if there'd been a connection, but sadly I think it would have been. Mm. We've got seventy six Totters Lane in episode one. Yes, I we mean, have. Not entirely sure why, but uh, you know, uh, I mean, at least <laughs> they spelt it right this time. Mm. I think is that a Levine element or is that a JNT? Elements of milking some publicity a bit like well, the, we, we've just a bit like had... the whole Sardis com- the comedian circuit being allegedly fixed. Yeah, it's about that's... three or four years, isn't it, since the Five Faces? So I suppose people will remember hmm. it a little bit from that. Yeah, the comedian. It, it, it's all very 
but it's more it's more about fan memory probably or or, or you know the, the Jeremy Bentham stuff so much as I suppose as what people have actually seen. Mm. I would say in its defence of, of the times when Totters Lane Junkyard has occurred in Doctor Who, like uh, Attack and uh, Remembrance of the Daleks. Obviously, I love Remembrance, but the Junkyard in that, I never really feel it is the Totters, Totters Lane Junkyard. Whereas this, I actually, I don't have to sort of suspend my disbelief mm. to imagine that it might actually be at that location. So it's, uh, to me, it's at least that got that going for it. Mm. But uh, on a plot basis, I cannot imagine what function it serves. <laughs> uh, I can't get past the gates. Not physically, but the... Um... Well, they locked, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Cl- yeah. Climb over. <laughs> but they got the gates right in Revelation. Well, okay, they misspelled them, but but at least they made it, at least they made the effort instead of sticking up a random sign next to it as they do in this one. Although I suppose in it's supposed to be 1963 then, whereas now it's 1985, so they might mm. have knocked the gates down by then. Yeah, true. Ah, good point, yes. The TARDIS dematerializes from the junkyard and then appears outside the merchants where they where they enter the sewers. Well, I, I mean, basically it's just an opportunity for Colin Baker to get a couple of rhymes in for the Valyard early on because there's a junkyard and a scrapyard. <laughs> 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 while, while we're talking about that, location i'm also somewhat confused by the police officers um they are not real police officers but are they working for lytton and if so yeah why? they're meant to be lytton's two. It is two creepy policemen that he goes off with at the yeah. end of resurrection presumably so rather than taking them to tell us he constructs an elaborate bank heist story to recruit some completely different people <laughs> and then leave his yeah. police officers behind well, he couldn't have brought Brian Glover with him if he'd, if he'd gone with the two police officers. True. They they seem completely ineffective anyway. Like, they just sort of... Ha- they couldn't even no, speak. No, they have no lines, and they just sit down and allow themselves to be yeah. handcuffed. Considering, they, I just seem to remember them being fairly hard, hard-arsed in Resurrection of the Daleks. Mm. I think they were gu- gunning people down left, right and centre and... Um, at least shoot someone, yeah. And then quite... I can't remember whether they were Dalek replicants or, or just... His henchmen, but yeah, and in this they are indeed very ineffective. Oh, I don't know. I what were they? And we've gone and we've done Twin Dilemma already, haven't we? And and we've talked about how how you appear to be getting some character progression for Colin in the course of that and the instability and so on, and then it and then it just goes horribly off kilter in the last couple of minutes by having the Doctor go, you know, I'm normal again, or oh, am I? Perhaps I'll strangle you again. And then we pick it up again. <laughs> I mean, what was... I'm, genuine question. What is the reason why they didn't debut Colin at the start of season 22? What, I mean, what, is it just as simple as J&T thought it would be Lars? You know. Yeah. They thought it would be an interesting way of hooking people by showing them the new Doctor and then making them wait for a full season. Here's this horrible it guy. Was a strategic Come decision. back in nine months' time. Yes. To see if he's mellowed. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> and if they'd ended yeah. on. Yeah. Spoiler alert, he hasn't. <laughs> 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 and where did that. Because that presumably meant. And did they pay Peter Dozen for a full season and. and That's a good let question. Him have four weeks off? Because presumably know. he'd have. Uh, five five doctors would have balanced out against. Hmm. Yeah, if, if they'd done. If they'd done Warhead in. Season twenty, then you could kind of see. Okay, maybe they were they contracted Davison for three times twenty six and ran out of stories for him, so they got calling in early. But mm. I don't know. Interesting. But yeah, it's and it's so much. Just why would you start with? Yeah, you know, why would you start your series, season with this? And I guess mm. the, the, the side men, the side men are the answer. But but yeah, to do something so continuity heavy. So you ask that question. They got eight point nine million viewers. Hmm. On the fifth of January, okay, but presumably on the twelfth of January they got seven point two million viewers. So, <laughs> so fundamentally, you know, people were excited by whatever publicity mm. the BBC had done for that first episode. But either they were less excited by what they saw, or people forgot about it by the time the next week came around. I don't know. We, I mean, we're still talking about only four channels, mind you, so it wouldn't have been that hard to find. Mm. Might depend what ITV had on. Very true. Yeah, maybe. I, I, my research didn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Uh, one of the things I actually do like about Attack is I know screaming is a bit of a companion cliche, mm -hmm. but the cliffhanger for episode one, mm -hmm. that scream just works brilliantly from Perry. Like It just sort of segues into the closing theme and becomes almost a musical element as opposed to a generic scream. And it's one of the few things, I think, in the whole story where I actually just think, oh, wow, actually, actually, that's good. Uh, yeah. Not not good in a, like, we don't we don't really need more screaming companions, but mm. it's nice that there are, are at least a couple of, or one example in this case, where it actually is quite powerful. Okay. I'd never noticed that. Yeah, she usually goes, no, 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 and then she screams. Yeah. And the music yeah. crashes. Oh, da -da 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 -da. Yeah, I, I know they got, um, they got Bonnie to... Didn't they get Bonnie to scream in a certain key at the end of Terror of the Verve Voice Part 1? That, so they that's, could... the, uh, that's the rumour, yeah. Well, that's the rumour. But it is a bit odd, now you come to mention that, because you know, they're, they're converting people right, left and centre, but they just, they're just going to shoot Perry. I mean, unless, of course, they just don't do cyber women. Mm -hmm. uh, until, <laughs> until, until Chibnall, Chibnall. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> While we're on the music, uh, I find the incidental music really detracts from my enjoyment of the story yeah. throughout Agreed. it's extremely obnoxious there's a few times when it it reverts back to the nice quiet subtlety of earth shock mm. and and some of the uh, more mechanical bits but the, the it's really intrusive and any time it's trying to be jolly <laughs> is is mm. extremely irritating it's mal it's and the steps and slump, sun and it? yeah it, yeah I almost feel the incidental music is shrink-wrapped to every movement that happens. Yeah. Uh, like the, the doctor good, walks up here. Do, 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 mm. And the doctor walks back down. <laughs> do, 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 do. Like just, just jog yeah. on. Mm. <laughs> stop, stop being so in your face. Yeah. There, there are specific moments where people touching things produces a sting from the music, uh, and it's just extremely distracting. Mm. Yeah, I agree, though, that the the exceptions to that are the softer Earthshock elements. And actually, I think, to my mind, the, the cryon, can you call it a theme? It's just yeah. ethereal ethereal mm. notes. Yeah. It's, nothing it's, to, it's nothing to write home about, but it's not, it's not aggressive, so it gets a little tick next mm. to it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I quite like... Nicola Bryant does a, a decent job in this. I mean, it's she's got very, very little to go on. Mm. It's got a terrible costume and fair, some fairly rotten dialogue, and I don't know. It's, but but I, I feel like she's giving it. Yeah, mm. I, I agree with that. I thought that very nice, uh, nice performance. Yeah. She seems to uh, emote quite a lot in. Uh, there's good close-ups of her doing her best. Mm. And Sarah Green. Was I mean, funnily enough, as 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 a child of the eighties, I actually remember Sarah Green as sort of actress before she was on Blue Peter. So I mean, it, it wasn't that big a surprise oh. to see her turn up in something. Um, I mean, she's the least convincing of the cryons, but uh, but yeah, yeah, it's um, it's definitely a good thing that um, apparently that was Matthew Robinson's idea that to get women playing all the cryons mm. and just cast them as female because otherwise Perry would have been the only woman in the entire yes. in the entire story. <laughs> Which is just mm. uh, then again, that's back with um back, back with recasting Bell Reed as or casting Fraser Captain as Bell Reed instead of um some hard bitten. I think Eric had a bit of a blind spot in that regard, didn't he? Mm. <laughs> Eric or Paula? Yep. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Mm. Coming back to th <laughs> thinking about things that make this interesting that aren't what we ended up with on the screen. So, Joe, so they, originally they asked Jerry Davis to pitch this, to mm -hmm. pitch a Cyberman story, and he came up with the genesis of the Cybermen, about which I know relatively little. Hasn't there been a big finish done an adaptation of it? I'm pretty sure. No, stuff well, didn't, has come out didn't, didn't Big Finish do the one that was going to be Revenge of the Cybermen? Maybe oh, they was that the. Well. Yeah. And allegedly they, they rejected that for being too retro. Which, mm. <laughs> considering what we ended up with, um, seems uh, odd. And then the other, there was the other version. The earlier drafts of this were actually set on Halley's Commas. They didn't have Telos in it, and I think they had the 
the crayons would. Lo- I d- did they live inside Hattie's Comet? But they. Well, that would make sense because that would be cold. I think they were luring, or they were trying to lure, um, lure the cyber controller there in order to kill him. I think with Litton's help. Was, this I mean, was, there wouldn't be an atmosphere. But, it would be cold. Yes. Yeah. So it all sounds a bit more, you know, possibly more interesting. And Hattie's Comet was, hmm. um, well, obviously, yeah. In terms of the idea, the idea of comets smashing into Earth and that kind of stuff would come out in 1980 is really when mm. when that that idea, with regard to the dinosaur extinction, took off. And mm. yeah, so Eric had already name checked that with Earthshock in '82, but obviously Ali, Ali's comet was heavily in the news because it came back late '85, early '86. A very disappointing mm. apparition. I just about caught one mm. glimpse of it. <laughs> I remember peering and thinking, is that tiny smudge? Yeah. Mm. Fascinating that there was a a version of the script that was that different if Eric Sayward was being his own client. Mm. I wonder what prompted him to do a, a ground up restructuring and inject Talos and everything else into yeah, it. Yeah, good question. Interesting. But I get I get the impression well, that's the thing. I think everyone had a... It feels like it was probably a lot of people sitting around having a hand in it. I think Ian Levine was presumably providing copious notes on what bits of cyber law they could rip off. JNT was throwing advice on the sidelines about things that elements he was in there, like the mm. like the comedian circuit subplot. Mm. Yeah, what influence Paula Woolsey had, if any, we don't know, but... Yeah. Talking of of um, sort of cyber law, the the, uh, the other thing, I mean, again spotted by the um, the info text was the fact that the Cybermen, you know, they've got, they've got plenty of um, of weaknesses, but oddly enough, the one they choose is coming to some homing beacon or something, <laughs> rather than yes. gold or um, gravity or all the other ones that they've always had, uh, radiation, yeah. shooting them in the head. The cyber the Cybermen have just one weakness <laughs> and it's not one you've heard before. <laughs> Weird. We got anything else we want to say about this before we move on? I might be more or less spent on attack, really. Um oh yeah, one one thing that I'm gonna put out as a general query for our for our listener. Um listeners. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd I'd genuinely be interested in a as I have a niggling feeling that with the mu- the the Hallie's Comet music that they use for the bits of stuff where they where they put Hallie's Comet on the scr- on the screen and possibly the graphics they use for that, I have a feeling I recall that being reused later in the year when Hallie's Comet actually turned up in some completely different context on an astronomy programme or one of the many many programmes that's the bead rolled out around that time. Hmm. And I've just got this vague feeling of it. Oh, that bit was in Doctor Who, wasn't it? Yeah, I would be very grateful. I've I've done minimal Google research in order to (laughs) see whether whether anything obvious came up. Hmm. But uh, yeah, if anyone else has that memory, I'd be uh, very interested to hear. Okay. Hmm. Well, and I guess my final uh, word on the matter would be, you know, sometimes people say to fans like us when we complain about exposition in modern Doctor Who, they say, well, you know, you you, you never complain about it when it's uh, in the old st- series. But, but it turns out that we don't much like exposition uh, on screen when we see a lot of it. So, so there. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, whether it's old or new. And I have, I have another... Sixth Doctor quote from the end of the story to uh, to finish this, yeah, to on, which I think is more appropriate than the misjudgment one is the didn't go very well, did it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sorry, but yeah, it's um usually I enjoy watching, you know, I, I, it's not that I, <laughs> don't get me wrong, it's <laughs> it's not I I always enjoy the chat, but uh, usually I enjoy rewatching. Hmm. Whatever we have to watch, even if it's something I approach with a somewhat lack of enthusiasm, you you find something in there. There's you hmm. know, Revelations is never going to be my favourite story, but there's there's a certain charm to all the William Gaunt and Eleanor Bronze stuff, and 
and so on. And this is just, it's such a chore. It's just like, uh, <laughs> I think is, I think probably, I haven't, I haven't attempted time dash, but I get the impression at least time dash has some glitz and Paul Darrow to, to, um, recommend yeah, this. I think I'm inclined to be a bit more lenient on it, but mainly because it's got Cybermen in it, and I just like Cybermen. Um, but that's as far as it goes, really. Mm. I actually enjoyed watching it today, strangely enough. Probably the most I've enjoyed watching it, because I was trying to, I was trying to follow it as a story, mm. trying to understand each of the narrative threads, because I was conscious that I'd never. Never really got a grasp of it. So in 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 working out what was wrong with mm. it, I came to appreciate the sort of sixty percent of a of a story that was present. But fundamentally, it's just fun seeing Cybermen on screen. Mm. The pleasure of the dissection. falling to bits. It's, it's one yeah. of my favourite Cyber, Cyberman designs as well. Mm. Got yeah. a soft spot for the eighties ones. Yeah, Absolutely. that's true. Yeah. And I like the uh, the stunt chest units that have floppy cables. I noticed the those, yeah. They look pretty yeah. good, actually. Yeah, they do. And I have no explanation for that Cyberman with a big lump on the side of his helmet that's covered in silver foil. I was pondering what that mm. was for. I wondered whether his voice box had fallen out of the helmet and they couldn't fit it back inside, so they strapped it to his shoulder. Could it have been prepped for an explosion effect? No, no, it's the cyber lieutenant oh. just walking around talking to the controller. Oh. He's got a big, like, a cigarette packet-sized thing on his shoulder. Maybe he's a smoker, I don't know. <laughs> That's another re- another reason to re-watch it now. Thank you. Maybe it's meant Thanks, to, Gav. Is it meant to be some some rank insignia, a bit like the black like handlebars? No, no, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a piece of prop that try, they're trying to conceal with electrical tape. But yeah, so also when the Cybermen throw Flast out of the explosives room, look out for the crew member lurking on the right of picture, which I spotted today for the first <laughs> time. He's just crouched in the corner, which I'd never seen before. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a starring moment, I suppose. If that was me, I'm not sure if I'd be proud or not. <laughs> <laughs> you'd, 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 you'd freeze frame it and blown it up. You know, oh, and have it on your yeah, on your wall. Have it on A one by now, yeah, right up here. <laughs> okay, well, if you want to get um, another cup of tea or something, we'll we'll come back in five minutes and have a go at the next one. I think that sounds like a good idea. Cool. Back in a minute. Cheers. DVD yeah, was animated though, wasn't it? Wasn't that more like 2013 or something like that? Sorry, which one? The animation of the DVD animation animated fourth episode wasn't that roundabout. Oh, ten- tenth Planet was. Sorry, sorry, ten- oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm getting mixed up now because of because they're of the so, They're so too. similar. They're, <laughs> 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 Wait a they're so similar, Richard, that you've actually mixed them all up in your head. Yeah. yeah. No, I got excited when somebody mentioned Tenth Planet. I've forgotten about Attack of the Cybermen now. Sorry, it's my fault. <laughs> well we'll be we we'll might be able to mention Tenth Planet a bit later when well, we indeed. move on to the other story. Yeah. Mm. I I read apparently Paula Moore's real name is Paula Woolsey. Yeah. Um I don't know why it's changed. Is that like a a, a credit name, a stage name for a writer? A pseudonym. Mm. Paula Agnew. I, yes. <laughs> Any relation to Wolsey, Wolsey the cat from the New Adventures? Or Cardinal Wolsey? Well, mm. well it's unlikely that That's she's a... a relative, given that he was a Catholic mm. priest. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you know. 